find something of value. A higher education community in South Africa and the unintellectualization. How central this humanity is. Welcome to the Academic Citizen. I'm your host, Nusipungu Mezulu. I am Umfiso Ungonyama, Umabene Mata. I am Ujagaja. These are the people I walk into the room with. These are the names that help me locate myself in space and time. In this episode, we're thinking with the theme of ancestors, something that intrigues hobbyists and historians alike. Whether for legal or mystic reasons, we seem to be curious about those who came before us. We're curious about what makes us, us. Many of us have seen images of that viral mural from New Orleans-based artist Brandon O'Dooms, which says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams, indexing that we may not only be the dreamers, but we the living may in fact be the dream. Now that's some inception. According to epigeneticists, we may not only inherit our ancestors' dreams, but we can also inherit our ancestors' traumas. Research conducted on non-human subjects in 2017 revealed that the environment we live in and the experiences of our ancestors can make genetic changes that can be passed out by whipping 14 generations. That's 16,384 people whose experiences eventually lead to you. We're still far from a full understanding of what this research means for human subjects, but it is worth considering that my 12th great-great-great-great-grandmother, living in the early 17th century, passed down more than her dreams, but also her traumas. Reading archival materials from the 17th century, I learned that she bequeathed me survival in a place that would begrudgingly accept me as its native daughter. That's 300 years. It's a very long time. I can't help but wonder what I do about my ancestors' nightmares. When I think of ancestors, I often don't think back to the 17th century. That's way far. But I do think about the black and white photograph of my grandfather on his horse taken in the mid-20th century. This tangible artifact allows me to imagine what dreams he had for me and the dreams I have for him. I never got to meet my grandfather, but he's been photoshopped into contemporary photographs of my family gatherings. There, standing behind my aunts and uncles, I see my face in his stoic face. The shifting archive is a comforting resemblance, rendered uncanny and dreamlike in a new context. Perhaps the mustachioed painter Salvador Dali's surrealist painting is apt in helping me feel through what it's like to consider ancestors in this dreamscape of melted clocks Dali investigates temporality and like most of us we're notoriously bad at grasping the scope and the working of time my ancestors you see are both here in the present but also there in the past the photo I have of my grandfather helps me scan the past in an attempt to identify its perceived similarity with the present offering a life raft in the uncertainty of the present. Humans are deeply fond of creating causal links out of correlation, and I'm no different. This is why I think I like Daddy's painting, because it breaks with linear time, and it seems to ask, do you know what time it is? Historical information companies like Ancestry.com have created a frenzy of DNA testing. As the largest for-profit genealogy company in the world, it has shot to fame from its obscure start in 1983, to becoming the go-to reference for biotech-based investigations through the use of DNA sequencing. With a simple self-swap at home, you can ship your DNA to their offices and they can tell you where your ancestors lived hundreds up to thousands of years ago. Now, as a South African, I am immediately suspicious and intrigued by a company that offers an ethnicity estimate I'm also the same woman who is delighted to learn that there are people born Gomezulu, Eswatini, in Malawi. Scanning through my clan names, I find relations across so-called ethnic groups. I do find it suspicious that we're re-territorializing belonging through DNA testing. For me, as someone who grew up in the shadow of an identity assigning colonialism that was a birth date, with its penchant for dispossession under the guise of homelands, I find this whole DNA 
testing of ancestry a little bit creepy because despite the hegemonic attempts to fix identity in time and place, ancestry is far richer and far more complex story. The process of understanding our ancestry is at once about excavation and digging deep into the past, but it's also about the ways in which the past protrudes and bleeds into the present. You might have seen shows like the BBC's Who Do You Think You Are, which has inspired spin-offs in South Africa, the United States. When you watch these celebrities tracing their family trees with the help of historians and genealogy experts, this show promises to give viewers the tools to dig into their own pasts and uncover part of their ancestry and the role it plays in their lives today. Something a bit ghoulish, right, about ancestors that comes from our imaginaries and horror movies. And yet, for me, I don't have such a disposition. For me, ancestors do more than just skulk in the shadows of family archives. And for many of us, ancestors are seen as a vital aid in making sense of now, offering both wisdom and comfort. Whether you treat your ancestors as guides or simply a DNA pool, ancestors are as much about who we were as they are about who we imagine we might become. In our last episode, Professor Ikani explored blue that makes up 71% of our planet. Traversing surface and depths of the ocean is not unlike swimming through the surface and depth of our ancestry. From the salt in our oceans to the minerals that make up our bodies, we are inextricably linked to our ocean commons, which offer us an inheritance we steward for future generations. The technologies that we have for exploring the ocean may not mark progress for non-human species. In this episode, we think about some of the tools for understanding who our ancestors are, rather than hauntings or maybe even roots. What if ancestors are portals whose cartography is continuously made and remade? Come with me as we read the old and new writings on the wall with archaeologist Dr. Sven Usman and ask what water can't wash away as we peek into the archives tucked away in family ice cream tubs with free radical writer Yolandri Apisani. And if history is not itself, but a representation, we ponder what lives alongside the clock of Western modernity and learn to read promiscuously with Dr. Mohammed Shabani. Dr. Sven Usman is an archaeologist, a lecturer and activist at the University of Western Australia School of Social Sciences. I sat down with Sven to talk about the forgotten worlds beneath and all around us. Before that, I'd just like to acknowledge the country I'm on. So, Nala Karach Rajuk, Mut Kian Karak, Nidja Butcher. I acknowledge the unceded Wajuk land from which I present from Burlu, otherwise known as Perth, Western Australia, uh, where I'm based as an archaeologist at the University of Western Australia's Department of Archaeology and Centre for Rock Art Studies. I um, study archaeology and heritage in Southern Africa and Northern Australia. And also contemporary archaeology, which to many people sounds a bit like a contradiction, but it's essentially really just looking at the world around us, which is made out of materials, artifacts and things, and acknowledging that, you know, archaeology is constantly in production. Whatever you throw away today is the archaeology of tomorrow, for example. So, you know, I've, I've worked in museums and I've worked in universities and some sort of in between kinds of places in Southern Africa and in Australia and in the US as well. I grew up in sort of semi-rural South Africa and really liked being outdoors, being in the bush, those kinds of things was uh, sort of like school. My mum was a teacher. She taught me once, which is one of the more traumatic episodes in my life. Wonderful mother, but you know, <laughs> you only taught by your mum. And, you know, I'd, I'd just take off on weekends and I loved rocks and I'd collect rocks. So this this was in, in Krugersdorp, as it was called then, Mukhali City now. And, uh, you know, cradle of humankind, right? Or uh, actually, you know, probably like the third oldest cradle of humankind anyway. Later, I found out these rocks were mostly early Stone Age tools. I didn't know it at the time. They just sort of appealed to me. And then going to university as one of the first in my family to go to university, I didn't really know what to expect. And archaeology, because of essentially Indiana Jones, seemed great. It seemed a kind of outdoor pursuit. Of course, Indiana Jones is a sort of nasty tomb robbing kind of person sort of thing. And and it took me a while to adjust, but I, I then liked archaeology even more because it combined 
the outdoor with thinking about it and trying to construct some sort of narrative from the past, from these various fragments, a fairly standard kind of narrative. And I tried sort of everything. I tried excavation archaeology, Stone Age, Iron Age, as we periodized these things. And it was while excavating a Rose Cottage cave under Lynn Wadley uh, on the Lesotho South Africa border that I just happened to be invited on a rock art field trip. I think the third member of the, the field team was down with alcohol poisoning and I had a first aid certificate, so I got onto the trip. And the rock art really sparked with me because the, the rock art just seemed to to say something, you know, it's much more agentive than say a stone tool. Well, a stone tool is probably equally as agentive. Our theory is probably the problem, but you know, there was a story there. There was ethnography there. It was both old and it was recent. A, a lot of archaeology has this problem of always wanting to find the oldest, which is also the most socially distant and least meaningful from us, as opposed to the most recent. And so, you know, my, my sort of trajectory was essentially uh, I studied at Wits, and after Martyrs, was lucky enough to get a job at National Museum. In Bloemfontein in the rock art department. I was the head of department, which was one person, me, and later two. <laughs> but it was, you know, great. For about a decade, I stayed there and did field work all over the show. Then got invited to do a scholarship in the States and studied for my, my PhD there. Fought in prison for a bit, which was very interesting. Came back to South Africa to lecture at Pretoria and then down to Cape Town as the curator of archaeology at, at Ezeco. And then in 2013, moved across to Australia, where I've been working on and off since 96 uh, on top end rock art and sort of find myself now here. And, you know, some of those things were sort of semi-planned, but a lot of it just sort of happened. And you had these moments where you're like, oh, do I do this or don't I do this? Luckily, I have a very supportive partner. Uh, you know, whenever I was kind of like, oh, should we go to the States? You kind of go around to go like, of course, let's let's give it a go. You know, it's like, all right, well, let's do it. So, yeah, that's that's sort of how how it's roughly worked. And, and I've enjoyed being in, in sort of museums and universities and, and a few spaces in between because they give you quite a broad range of exposure. It's like being in a giant treasure chest, sort of studying both the past and the recent past and thinking about the future. I wanted to know how Sven thinks about ancient rock art and contemporary graffiti. We've got to watch out with this oldest thing. It's, it's really a kind of androcentric bias, establishing a kind of hierarchy and set of progenitors and, and all of those different kinds of things. It's part of a game, of course. If you find the oldest something or other or the oldest known to be technically accurate, then you're likely to get better funding than finding the seventh oldest something or other uh, kind of thing. But I think we've got to work against that. If you want that whole continuum, the oldest known does have a function. It's useful to know when a practice was coming about, you know, when humans become symbolic in their outlook, all of those kinds of things. But you also want to know everything that happened in between. So, for example, when I'm up in sites in the northern Kimberley with traditional owners, there's one site we've dated, this is not rock art, but an archaeological site, 50,000 years, you know, it's published the great fanfare and everything, and the TOs, the traditional owners, their comment on it is, it's a nice place to fish, it's on a river, and that's it. Then nearby, we found another site at which there's rock art in a style known to be quite recent, and there are items, metal items from nearby farms that Aboriginal people creatively repurposed from spears and all sorts of things. And suddenly people are animated, you know, they tell, oh, you know, which uncle or auntie was that, and how does this work, and how does that work? So that then sort of got me to thinking, well, you know, not actually that. What got me to think it was about 20 years ago when I was at National Museum in Bloemfontein was the centenary of the South African War, the Boer War in the old language. And I was asked to give a paper on it. And I kind of went, oh, I've got this every year in school and I'm just trying to forget the whole damn thing. I don't want to give a paper on it. But then I realized in the central interior of Southern Africa, looking at the engravings, now, different traditions, but all sorts of different traditions we now know. But there were also markings made by the soldiers during the Boer War, British and Boer soldiers. And I sort of went, oh, OK, let's have a look at those. Anyway, I presented this paper and at the end of it sort of commented to the audience, you know, is this, you know, white in the language of the time, white rock art? And was, was struck by the reaction of the audience. Some thought it was a joke and kind of laughed. And the others thought it was offensive to sort of say that, you know, the subtext kind of being, you know, sand and such like make rock art and we make art. So I got thinking about it, thinking, well, what actually is the distinction between rock art, between art, between historical markings, between 
uh, graffiti. As a kind of very long story, you end up finding out that rock art is both ancient and recent. I was with a community two weeks ago that make hand stencils and such like still today. So it's very old and recent. And graffiti, which everyone accepts to be recent, actually goes back quite some way in time. And one of the problems, though, is defining graffiti. Graffari from the Latin, it just means a mark on a surface, usually an unauthorized mark. Susan Phillips writes very well on this. But you kind of think a little bit, and I've thought about it quite a lot, because there are a lot of things that really are historical inscriptions or markings. There are a lot of things that look like graffiti, but are highly commercial and co-opted as a subculture. And to me, it's really graffiti has some sort of spirit of resistance about it. So it's someone sort of so there can be some rock arts that are also graffiti. Now, San, and I use that word without any pejorative connotation, San Bushman rock art that shows, you know, European settlers, for example, to me, you could understand that as graffiti in its resistive kinds of elements, for example, even though it looks like rock art. So it could be both rock art and graffiti. But then I kind of think, and this might sound a little bit weird, but it's again invoking kind of actor network theory, post-humanism and those things. What about graffiti itself? What does it want of us? You know, it doesn't have an agency and even a sentience, for example. So it's it's a transgressive artifact. To me, it kind of exists to make everyone unhappy at some level. And part of our problem is it's a lack of precision in defining what graffiti is. Some people will say, well, you get gang tags. So gang tags are generally all about, you know, violence, drugs, all of those kinds of things. And then you get right through to kind of community sanctioned murals kind of thing. And it's all under this big term graffiti. Graffiti. So it's a very imprecise term. So we need a lot more precision there. And that's where I think archaeology can be useful. It, in many ways, is a very colonial discipline. It's an open question as capable of decolonizing, but it's certainly using Dubois' notion of, you know, using master's tools to dismantle master's house. We're very good at typologies, at classifying, at describing, all of those things. And when you apply to graffiti, which at first blush is this anarchic kind of artifact that's all over the show, suddenly you see, no, it's actually very ordered. There are definite types of graffiti. You can date them. You can do interviews. There are obviously ethical issues, but you can do interviews with the people who've made it, the writers who've made it. And suddenly you realize, well, it's an artifact, just like rock art, just like a hand axe, you know, any of these things. And it's amenable, at least in some ways, to study by archaeology. And, and there's now been a fair bit of scholarship of graffiti in archaeology. And, you know, we like the materiality of things. You know, graffiti and rock art are, are not necessarily the same, and I don't want to get too many definitions, but they're both exercises in making place through marking. So you, you place marking and you place making. It's sometimes contested, it's sometimes more uh, sort of consensual, if you like, but these are part of that world around us, and they're really interesting artifacts that we have and which you know, are not going to go away and which tell us a lot about the past, but particularly about the present and, and what we value in terms of what kinds of images and marks we value in which which kinds of places. Yeah, so that's where I think the so what sort of factor is in there. How do you know, right, that something is, you know, constitutive of rock art as opposed to early graffiti? Is there a way you can tell? It's a difficult one. Like, like that example, you know, when you find some rock art and it's showing settlers in a battle or something, you might argue and, and you know, people will disagree with what I'm saying, that graffiti is just about resistance, for example. And I think that's the productivity of graffiti as an artifact. It gets people chattering and that kind of thing. But say now you go back, you know, 20,000 years. We've recently dated a macropod painting, a two meter high kangaroo at 17,000 years in northern Australia. It looks like a kangaroo, but as we know from ethnographically informed rock arts, what something looks like and what its inside story are can be very, very different things. And it's quite frightening for then archaeologists to admit, you know, very often we, we simply won't know. We need these words, rock art, stone tool, graffiti, etc., to categorize things. But even calling something a stone tool can be misleading because it stresses the economic. But people might have traveled considerable distance to get that raw material 
from a special place, for example. There might be ritualized ways of working that stone tool. We know there are where people see a stone tool as having a life cycle. You have the lump of rock, you bring it into being like a birth, you work it as you develop it, you haft it onto a piece of wood to make a spear or an arrow, for example. So there's a marriage of materials. It then dies. You know, these are ways that communities living today and in the recent past in form, that's how they think about these different kinds of things. So a lot of the time we just don't know and we don't deal with sort of uncertainty and absence very well. We we don't tend to deal with it very well. But I have often wondered, you know, with especially the love of Banksy that we've all kind of gone through in the early 2010s, 2000s, and Banksy's response to being placed in museums and, you know, whether it was Banksy or not, we don't know. But I do think there's something quite interesting about like how we were thinking about archiving our materials. And especially now in South Africa, there's a lot of conversation about thinking around personal archives because historically what has been codified and put in museums has often been the hegemonic narrative. And I'm just curious also just about like the relationship then between museum archiving of what might be seen as transgressive or resistance art, which is precisely trying not to be institutionalized, but is speaking to the institution, how you think about it in your work in this larger conversation around rethinking the archive as beyond kind of what the state or the hegemonic narrative would like us to imagine as the legitimate archive. How do you see then graffiti in that kind of conversation? Yeah, so that's a big one. And so maybe some sort of overall framing for it and and having worked in museums for about half of my career is that, you know, I don't think this museum community, and and I include myself there, so it's self-criticism, but thinks seriously enough about the promises around archiving, curating, and so forth. So generally, when you get to, you know, a standard museum, a national, whatever kind of museum or repository, they'll have a policy on collecting and such like. Or if you look at the legislation of the country around heritage and depositing material in the museum, you know, it generally becomes, it transforms. A, it becomes state property, usually. So that's It's quite a big thing, you know, that the state now owns that because this includes, for example, human remains. A human remains transforms from a person into an object. So that's why the whole repatriation movement is to try and rehumanize those people and restore their dignity. The second thing that happens is around time is that generally through legislation and policies, state archives promise to keep something that comes into their collection in perpetuity. So they're saying forever. I don't know when forever ends, but it's a hell of a long time from now. And there might not even be humans around. In fact, almost certainly there will not be humans around if evolution is a valid process. So we haven't really thought about that time aspect because people are continually, you know, as we grow to now almost 8 billion people, we create more and more and more stuff. You know, contemporary archives, people are looking at COVID archives, for example, Each day, if you work out how many, uh, I've done this for archaeology, sort of roughly, but they're roughly between 20 and 50 million tons of masks discarded each day on the planet. So that's all part of now the archaeological heritage, or you can collect it for a museum. At Ezeco, we'd often have discussions about, you know, what about collecting plastics and McDonald's wrappers and these kinds of, they're an important part of the world around us. but can we continue to collect? We've got to build buildings. We've got to have staff in an underfunded sector to have it. We can't just continually collect. Sometimes people say, well, the answer is then virtual. You know, people then say, ah, graffiti. You know, you can't really haul out a graffiti wall. But people try it with Banksy to sell, I suppose. But that lends itself to photography, photogrammetry, VR, video, all of those kinds of things. That still requires maintenance. You have to have computers, computer programs. You have to migrate those um, operating platforms every few years. You have to have skilled operators, all of those kinds of things. And then again, going back to that point, the graffiti that isn't really meant to be owned, it's a property crime. It's meant to, you know, be one in the face for, you know, whoever owns that property or the government or the state. Now the state has a kind of avatar or version of it. They'll display it in a very controlled space with text, either audio, visual, both. It sort of tells you what that's meant to mean and why it's good or why it's bad, which might be entirely contrary to the graffiti writer's intentions, for example. But looked at through the eyes of the graffiti itself, 
you might then say, well, the graffiti will probably be quite happy because it doesn't like anyone to be happy with it. So whatever the intention of the original maker is, it's going to acquire other meanings depending who the audience is. Other writers might add to it. They might, you know, the city council might go over it. So there's very much a life cycle at work there. So at best, the museum can capture something in a moment. And it generally doesn't capture a process. It captures an artifact. You know, it's a sort of synchronic diachronic kind of issue. At the same time, like Buskevart and others, a lot of graffiti writers, Keith Haring and that Banksy, you know, they play the game. They quite like it also being in the museum. They say, well, why can't it be in a museum? It can be on a wall, it can be on a sidewalk, it can be in a museum, for example. And it's then a challenge to the museum or the, the collection as to how it then archives it. You know, getting to the, the part of the question about personal collections, people say, well, they can't last forever. Well, well, actually, the state ones can't either. Ask any, you know, collections manager about how much material gets destroyed each year just through wear and tear, not through lack of care, but just through wear and tear. So personal archives much likely resonate with, with a family, with a community, with a set of individuals, and they may or may not last for a long time. But they're important to counter those state archives. As you say, the state often, you know, goes for that, the, the so-called big man history. You know, people's you know, the castle was built by Jan van Riebeek and people kind of go, well, you know, that was a lot of work. You should have got someone to help him build it kind of thing. You know, where is the history of all the other the workers kind of in there? And do they all have to be archived in that state archive or can they be in civil society at large? Yes, they're going to kind of come and go. But here I think technology is really useful. You know, we do have hard drives and all of these different kinds of technologies now, drones, VR, all of those. Archaeology really likes its toys. And they, they can be used in a very liberatory kind of way. You know, the applications that can bring out hidden detail in rock art. Uh, people can remix these into videos, into personal histories, into artworks, into those kinds of things. So there have always been personal archives, but it would be useful to have some sort of connective tissue. To me, one of the key questions simply is, is what is heritage? You know, having worked in government organizations and that sometimes, you know, the so-called stupid question is not so stupid. So what is heritage? What are the different notions of heritage? There's a state sanctioned notion of heritage, their personal notions, their community notions. And just by asking that question is really important. You know, a place might and a feeling might be important. A story your grandmother told you might be important. Whereas, you know, the million year old handbag People go, yeah, OK, you know, it's just a, a lump of stone kind of thing. So, you know, what is heritage is to me a really serious and fruitful question to ask. And then depending on what people say, you know, what are the challenges in capturing, disseminating that heritage? So, mm. you know, that's, I think, a big issue. Our definitions of heritage are necessarily political, revealing contestations which we live with every day. You know, archaeology is culpable here in that, you know, we have Stone Age, Iron Age, all of these things, where it's, you know, looked at another way. Well, we're still in the Stone Age. You know, you've got granite kitchen tops, your computer runs off silicon, you know, all of these kinds of things. And then, you know, also in terms of language, we do need categories to kind of understand the world. There is fuzziness. It's a tricky one. Just because there's fuzziness at the boundaries doesn't mean the boundaries don't exist, but they're moving along kind of all the time. The question everyone kind of asks at some point is, you know, who am I? You know, who am I in a sort of narrow sense in my society today? And who am I, you know, cosmically? You know, how does it all work? And I think archaeology, paleoanthropology, those kinds of disciplines can be useful here. They don't have to give up their kind of scientific expertise. That's often why people look to their practitioners and such like. But they've got to realize it's not the only way of looking at the world. So some classic third wave feminism, for example, Haraway, others, you know, science is powerful. And it's situated, it's partial. It sees certain things in a very powerful way, but it doesn't see everything and explain everything. That allows space for all sorts of people to come into what has been claimed as a sort of academic space. Not necessarily everyone is as equal. There'd be times, you know, contextually, where someone's contribution carries more weight rather than another person's. But as a process, it can't continue without all of those people in it. Archaeologically, we struggle with, OK, so looking at human identity and ancestry through time and what are the correlates in terms of material culture, artifacts and those kinds of things. You know, you're going to go, well, it's tricky now. It was tricky then. I mean, this struck me very forcefully when I was teaching a course on ancient African history in San Quentin prison in the U.S., 
So this was part of Associate of Arts degree program. So it, it was set up to prevent prisoners going back to prison because it cost the state a lot of money. They weren't doing it out of the goodness of their heart. It was an economic decision. But then various governments sort of watered down the program. And San Quentin was one of the few places that ran on a volunteer basis. And I was over there studying at the time. And the Center for African Studies at, at Berkeley said, can you give a course on ancient African history? And I said, yeah, sure. I didn't really think. I thought, no, okay, it sounds good. And I put together paleoanthropology, history, archaeology, sociology, those sorts of things. And of course, it was a very well-subscribed class at about 40 people, which is large for these classes, most of whom were African-American, Hispanic, and there were a couple of white guys kind of thing. And so the first class, as you can imagine, you know, people are very polite, but they do say, you know, who is this white guy teaching us about African history? And I would sort of anticipated this, and I said, well, you know, who here was born in Africa? And predictably, no one was. And I said, well, you know, I was born in Africa. And, and until then, I've never actually lived outside of Africa. It wasn't as a kind of like, I've got greater rights or you've got greater rights. It was just kind of people to think of these sort of nested identities uh, type of thing. And what you draw on, you know, is it a politics of land where, you know, you live or you come from, or you're born? Is it a politics of blood? You know, my blood is my passport, as a lot of Aboriginal people might say in Australia, when going to places they weren't previously allowed to. And you know, a lot of people kind of thought about, yeah, OK, interesting. And then towards the end of the 12 week course, the sort of lone, quiet white guy, quite a conservative guy, you know, conservative is probably slightly to the right of Attila the Hun, but a nice enough guy. And he was from Wisconsin and he said, I've always been very proud of my American identity, and my German ancestry. He says, but now I'm realizing there's this African component somewhere. You know, he was still putting it together somewhere kind of back there. And then the course went on and then it kind of went, well, you know, you're all just a product of all the mixing that went on that led to you, some of which we know and some of which we don't know. And But there is potentially a problem around DNA testing, you know, these DNA kits and all of those kinds of things that go around and prove your ancestry. So, you know, all they can do is chart certain markers of certain places where your ancestors would be. I once had an Indigenous scholar from Aotearoa, from New Zealand, a Maori person, say, I've done the ancestry test and it's got the marker that proves my Maoriness. And as you said, look, that's great, but what happens if it didn't have that marker? Would that disprove an identity? Whereas you identify, it's only you know, part of your identification might be biological and part of it is cultural. And those are kind of active decisions that are, are made at various scales, the individual, of a family, you know, reinventing itself, these kinds of things, you know, so-called koi and san are well-versed in this, you know, words like coloured, uh, it's, it's all in there. And we have to all be hybrid and creolized, otherwise we'd all have, you know, died of you know, all sorts of congenital type diseases and things. It's interesting, again, to think in the future, what will everyone look like? What will everyone identify as? What will their biology say they are? So again, there's all of that process that's already there literally within your body and in your social world that's around you. Another comment is, you know, often the creolization is seen as a biological process. You get people from different groups, however defined, intermarrying, having children, all of those kinds of things. But I often think of, you know, knowledge that it's very likely that sand in Southern Africa, the first black farmers moving in from sort of Central Africa, archaeology says, right, we can prove the farmers were there because we've got this pottery at this state, two and a half thousand generally is given as one of the older dates. But people would have heard things through their various chains of uh, communication, of networks and that a long time before. And it's really, the, I suppose, the thing about so-called creolization or whatever cognate word you use is you probably don't think about who you are and who your family is and that all that much until you come into contact with kind of another group kind of thing. And then, you know, you've got to kind of say, OK, so who are they? In order to understand who they are, I need to kind of solidify, I need to explain who I am and who I'm not kind of thing. And, you know, people do that from time to time, all the time. This is what an informed and skillful citizenry does. And I think in Southern Africa, probably more informed and skillful than in a lot of other places in the world. And other places of the world, the so-called marginal people are actually more skilled in this. And this is, I think, the future, the way the world is going increasingly urban, increasingly sort of fluid is you know, the, the old sort of norms and things and museums and dominant groups, you know, are going to fade away. And I think we're going to see quite a sea change in who's coming. But what exactly the shape 
of that new who is. It's hard to predict. And that's exactly the point. You know, it's, it's good because if it was easy to predict, governments would probably act against it. Kind of thing. Our ancestors have left us a wealth of archives, from early rock art to contemporary graffiti. I turn now to my conversation with Yolandri Apisami, where we discuss archives of belonging, rewriting ourselves and ancestral trauma. Hi, my name is Yolandri Apisami, and I am a media professional, a feminist free radical, working around the spaces of writing, of making zines, and general kinds of communication works for NGOs. I've been following Lynn's work for many years now, intrigued by our shared interest in the history of indenture across the Indian Ocean. I wanted to learn how she got into this work. Let me start with my father, which is maybe a weird point to start. But (laughs) so he works in government and he's been working in government since before I was born. And so I would be very interested in the stories he would tell me about governance. And that made me feel more inclined towards the political sphere, in a sense. And at the same time, at school, we were reading a lot of the Bronte sisters. And I was very into the idea of being a femme or being a woman writer. And so I had those two things kind of brewing in my mind as a teenager. I really wanted to be living in a cabin in the woods, writing things. And journalism was the more marketable way for my parents to justify that. They weren't very keen just studying an English degree. So journalism was the more useful kind of skill. It was really my master's work that prompted me to think, well, firstly, to even know about indenture and then to think about it more critically. I could tell through my work on domestic violence that the historical roots of violence within kinship structures, within family structures in Indian South African communities had to come from somewhere. And where is that somewhere? Where is that not necessarily Genesis point, but what informs the current rates of gender-based violence or violence against women or child violence in Indian South African families and indentureship especially when you're looking at Durban Indian communities, is definitely, it was such a powerful force in terms of how families were created and then managed and structured from the 1800s that it became important to surface in my master's research. Speaking of her experiences with Africa as a country, Lynn shares the importance of intergenerational learning in an academic sphere. Speaking of freedom to articulate personal and political positions. At the end of the process, I became not only a more confident writer, but just a more confident person in trying to explain my ideas to other people and also not be afraid of talking about indentureship or Indian South African identity from a place of shame or from a place of I'm a spokesperson for my entire lineage. As Black and Brown scholars, we are often asked to mine our histories, both sacred and private, in the service of academic exploration. Having access to knowledges which have historically been left out of the canonical texts and theories begs the question of how we navigate our heritage in the academy. Even in making this episode, I've had several reservations about what to say about my relationship to ancestors. I wanted to know about this affective burden of navigating this tension in Len's work. I felt that most keenly when I was writing my MA because there's certain kind of forms that your work needs to take. And it, at least in the politics department, needed to have this cool, neutral voice that we are taught in the academy to have about these things. And I wanted a hot, passionate voice. So it was a difficult conversation with myself about how much do you reveal and how much do you conceal. And concealing things is a strategy and silence about something is a strategy. And it doesn't mean that you don't know things or it doesn't mean that you have not done your due diligence with your academic work. But it just means that there are certain things that are sacred. So, for example, my field site was a temple and there's certain considerations around a temple, such as taking pictures or 
even speaking to certain people, there was a form of addressing certain people that I needed to take. And I took that on because I didn't want to come into the space and just trample over people's lives and things that they held sacred. So it was a touch and go kind of thing, really. And it happened on an ad hoc basis of, oh, this doesn't feel right. Like, I'm not comfortable with this. Or maybe I can take pictures at the temple, but it's only for my own use. It's only for my own writing purposes and not to be shared or disseminated with other people. But I think I struggled with that more when it came to talking about spirituality than indenture per se, because I felt and I still feel that indenture is such a marginal kind of historical factor, labor practice that isn't spoken about enough, not only in academic spaces, but just broadly. So, yeah, I didn't really have any sense necessarily privacy, but of sacredness talking about indentureship itself. Maybe aspects of it, but generally, I, I was just like shouting about indenture from the rooftops. There is something powerful about the excavation of generational knowledge. I wanted to learn more about how Lynn came to this place, where she wanted to shout from the rooftops instead of hiding in shame. Okay, let me tell you a story. We have to go back. <laughs> we have to go back to Heritage Day in the mid 90s. So I was. I grew up in White River, which is a small town in Bumalanga. And it's primarily like a farming town. So there are a lot of white Afrikaans people, a few white English people, and majority black people. So we heritage day at school. And I didn't want to wear Punjabi. I didn't want to wear Sharara. And I had already experienced some sense of Othering and otherness, wearing my dot, wearing my black dot, which my mom was very militant about me wearing to school and had already had some back and forths with teachers about, you know, oh, my God, what is this black mark on a child's face? And so I didn't want any more eyes on me. I didn't want any kind of visibility in that moment of Heritage Day. And so I had learned about the fur trackers at some point, and I was like, I'm going to be a fur tracker on Heritage Day. And my mom was like, okay, that's a bit odd. My dad was quite upset. You have a culture, you have a heritage. But I was like, dad, you don't get it. I just want to fit in with everybody else. And so I wore uh, one of my auntie's old uh, dresses that was very frilly. Don't know why I thought that registered as fur tracker, but <laughs> that was the dress I wore. And I remember feeling very dislocated at that moment. Like I knew that wasn't my heritage at all, but I felt almost safe. I didn't feel that sense of shame of like, oh, you're going to be this weird exotic figure. And at the point of being a child, I didn't have the kind of language I do now to understand what was informing that decision. And I also went to a Model C school. And at that point, talking about ancestry, like when you have to do those silly assignments of make a family tree, and <laughs> we could only trace it to my grandparents. And when it came to great grandparents, there were confusions over names because the names that were on any official documents also are not the names that people used in everyday speech to call those people. So it was very difficult to trace what my lineage is or my ancestry. And I think there is also the question of shame when it comes to indigeneity. And when it comes to, do you belong here? Do you not belong here? And being racialized in the way I am as a South Asian person, it often becomes a conversation of, even in like White River, my hometown, people will often assume I'm a tourist, I'm coming from elsewhere. A lot of the street harassment that's targeted towards me is, am I India, 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 India. So there's always a kind of insistence on non-belonging on placelessness so there is a level of shame that comes from that to actually talk through that and also talk through not knowing your ancestors from a certain point not knowing your lineage from a certain point but still affirming the fact that this is the place you belong 
in the literature around indenture, the Kalipani or the Black Waters figure centrally as a dislocating experience. I speak to Lynn about the significance of crossing the Black Waters in her work. Once you cross the Kalapani, which is such a great crossing, it means A, you're never coming back to India. Because once you've made that, who's going to come back? And so if you're never going to come back, what does caste mean to you? What does your village connections or kinships mean to you? And obviously that wasn't the case for all of the indentured laborers, but quite a few of them, once they left India, never went back. Once you make that Kalapani crossing, your caste is supposedly washed off of you as well. I find that really interesting because, you know, so much of the conversation in South Africa is around like the land, rightfully so, because land restitution is a big political and material kind of reality for many people to have access to dignity and a good life. But I seldom hear conversations around water and how we might think of our ancestry as related to water. So for myself, you know, my umbilical cord is buried where I am from. So my relationship to land is physically tethered with my literal umbilical cord being buried in my family's ancestral home. And I think it's really interesting to to also figure how water is also a part of a way in which we are connected to space and place and place making, mm. I guess. Mm, I mean, one of the rituals that my family practice, and I think I'm not sure if it's necessarily unique to Indian South African communities. I don't think so. But it's a Hindu practice where once a baby is born, their first hair, so I think it's after three months or so, gets shaved. And that hair gets put into whatever body of water is nearest to the family. So it would be put into a river. It has to be put into a body of water that will go into the ocean. So not a lake, not a dam. It has to be some kind of stream or river with the thinking that that hair will go via the river into the Indian Ocean and back into the Ganges. All this talk of indenture, I would be remiss if I didn't ask Lynn to offer us some spark notes, a bit of a history of what indentureship was, and to unpack with me how the afterlife of indenture shows up in contemporary life. The British still needed the colonies to be worked. They were still minerals and resources to have cheap laborers for, to get it out of the earth, to grow things, to manufacture things. And so the system of indentureship was introduced as a kind of stopgap. So once enslaved people were no longer, they were like, we're not going to work on the plantations. We don't want to do this. And some of them did, but majority didn't. And so India and China were looked to as places where you could access cheap labor and a kind of migrant working force that would come in, work the land on whatever plantation, and just go back to their quote-unquote homelands. So indentureship in South Africa happened when British sugarcane growers saw how indentureship was used. I think it was in Mauritius. And They got the idea that, oh, Port Natal would be a great place to grow sugarcane, but we do need a larger labor force because the native population, the Zulu people, were not about to be working on the plantations. They had their own systems of kinship. They had their own kind of interior politics and homes and according to the British cane growers were not reliable on the fields. So they brought in indentured laborers from South Asia. The first ships arrived in Port Natal in 1860 and the last ships I think arrived on in 1911. So during that period there were a variety of waves of indentureship. So the first group of people, they were mainly those who were general laborers in the sugarcane plantations. And as the waves of migration continued, there were more and more traders known as passenger Indians who um, boarded ships to come to Port Natal. The one that kind of immediately springs to mind or maybe is the most urgent to look at 
is how identity was formed around alienness, around shame, and also how that has led to severe anti-blackness in Indian South African communities and how that has kind of fomented in very perverse ways around being and belonging in Africa. And then the other big one is how that's manifested in gender making, because as the racial group of coolies, as Indian South Africans were known as, was made, as was gender. So there was a huge kind of gender imbalance in the first waves of ships coming to Port Natal. And so due to that, there were levels of violence against women happening. You could see that in indentured communities in the Caribbean, in Fiji as well. So I think that's one of the kind of afterlives that we really need to take seriously is just how gender and race were co-constituted. The study of indentureship is also the study of porousness. And it's the study of how can we think about fluidity and identity without thinking about borders or with understanding that migrancy is also like an ongoing process. The porousness or fluidity of identification often rubs against the wall of rigidity of structural impositions of identification. I asked Lynn why her work foregrounds informal archives. Non-formal archives, like let's say if we take a university archive as a formal archive, right? Those things have been existing for years and years and years and years in ice cream tubs, in Danish cookie tins. And for me, it's been easier to access those archival spaces. It's been easier to look at a copy of Indian Delights and think about the women's cultural group, to think about Zuleika Mayat's work through that, as opposed to going to the National Library and thinking about that moment in KZN's history through those archives. So I feel like alternative archives are softer and they're more tangible. They're almost less precious in a way, but more precious because people will tell you, you know, in granular detail about things that you do not have access to when you're working in more formalized archives. So for me, the value in that is to also understand how those things are living. So if I make a recipe from Indian Delights, how is that not a form of archival practice in a sense to be like, oh, this is a, a fricadelle recipe. Isn't that interesting? This fricadelle has come through various kind of cuisine histories and is now in an Indian Delights book. And I'm making it, eating it. It's delicious. But I'm also thinking about the kind of back end of that historically or socially that like led to this recipe being made and being codified in that way as well. But yeah, I don't know. I think I gravitate towards those so-called, I don't know, alternative archives just because they are softer, easier places to explore. And I find them a lot more interesting than going through court colonial documents from, you know, 1860 onwards. Mm -hmm. And there's more heart in those things and almost a more humanizing approach to whatever images or documents have been kept as opposed to when I'm reading those documents, like a court document and feeling quite disempowered through the process of archival research. From archives written across the Kalipani and tucked away in ice cream tubs, I turn now to think with our intellectual genealogies, rethinking the canon from diverse geographic, textual and sonic vantage points. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Mohammed Shabangu. I'm a DJ, music curator, reader, writer and an assistant professor of English at Colby College. I research and write about world literature, quote unquote, with a particular focus on contemporary African writing. What drew me to the area of world literature, or maybe even just literature in general, I guess, was a desire to understand the world in an almost inexhaustive kind of way. And I felt like 
you know, when I got to uni, you have a whole spread of, you know, subjects that you can choose from. And generally, that's where your impressions of a particular discipline are made. And my, my impression of the English situation at the school where we went to, Alma Mater, <laughs> it left little to be desired in terms of the excitement and enthusiasm that one expects from an African literature situation on the continent. Mo's desire to think enthusiastically with African and world literature allows him to understand society in a non-formulaic way. But before we get into the thick of it, I was drawn to the image that was right behind him. But before we even go there, I'm looking at you in your apartment and there is a portrait behind you. Who is that portrait of? Why is it in such a central place in your home? This is a picture on the wall, a portrait of my grandfather, J.B. Shabamu. And it was taken in 1951. And that's just a year before my mom was born. And he remains, I think, an example for me of a posture or disposition towards the world of open curiosity. You know, he was a very curious person, a very intellectual person, a very smart person, and a very, by all sort of capitalist accumulation of standards, successful man. I really like the idea of, you know, seeing him in his younger years, which I hadn't seen before. I have a lot of ancestral kind of energy in here, in my space. And I think that's part of, yeah, a reminder of, you know, that, I come from somewhere, <laughs> you know, not just come from somewhere, but also that there are people that I can see and point to <laughs> that I know in some way are responsible for the field of vision that I scour mm. in my work. I wonder what that kind of impulse about fetching ourselves and placing ourselves in these faraway locales, what that is. It's possibly to do maybe with a sense of quote-unquote belonging and not I don't mean like into the space or like to the geographical or physical space but maybe uh, because this is an impulse I didn't have when I was in South Africa right like and I don't think I would it would have felt as urgent and certainly it would have felt important but it wouldn't have felt like you know I must do this because I have living examples of that in one way or another and I think it's the idea of being removed from that and then still being expected to tap into the resources that that you know, well, spring offers. But of course, you're unable to because everything around you is Americana, right? And white as fuck. So I know we're talking about, you know, uh, intellectual ancestors and so on, but I don't think that I would be doing what I'm doing right now if it wasn't for my grandparents, in particular my grandfather, who himself was entrepreneurial and enterprising and so forth. But understood, I think he could see something in me that I didn't necessarily, you know, see myself. So he'd have me write towards his moribund years. He would have, he would dictate things like a business plan to me that I would have to write out. And I mean, I'm, we're talk, I'm like 13, 14, you know, and, you know, I'd have to write that out, read it back to him and so on. And it was like real stuff, right? Like not just sort of play, play kind of thing. It was like real, you know, like he'd have me like write out negotiation letters about, you know, the land that he was selling and so on. And I think there's something about like the sort of practice, like a weird sort of brief protege <laughs> period, I think that had me comfortable with writing and imagining as well. Because I think there was something about, we often don't respect the imaginative leaps that entrepreneurs and business people have to take in order to bring something to fruition, something that exists first in the mind or as an idea and so on. And so I think like thinking with him, imagining with him, problem solving alongside him is possibly one of the early stages of something clicking, right, in relation to my assessment of the world and my assessment of myself in the world and what I can do and so on. A conversation I had earlier this week, also for this episode on ancestors, Lynn and I were talking about the kind of double bind of understanding that our ancestry, our family history is this resource, in your words, that is integral to shaping how we 
view the world, how we move in the world, what we see as possible. And also recognizing how that can very easily be co-opted into a self-exoticization because of the the African only thinks from this uh, embodied place. Uh, it's really, yeah, right, right, <laughs> so it's it's right. definitely something that's been on my mind as like I'm thinking right. about this, this episode is just like how I want to be careful to not slip into the latter of asking you to self-exoticize, but also recognizing that like all intellectual traditions come from somewhere. It's just that other people's intellectual traditions are taken as normative. And like, of course, Russian scholars are going to write about the imaginary of Russia and the same with Welsh writers. And yet when an African writer does the similar thing, something else happens. And I'm I'm curious because of your interest in kind of world literatures and there's specifically that paper you wrote uh, in 2018, Refusing Interpolation. I'm curious how you kind of square these two desires of both grounding and also recognizing that often when brown and black folk are doing that grounding work, situating themselves, positioning themselves, it, it turns into a a box that won't allow us to think other things. It is a double bind and we are susceptible to self-exoticization. But then the question is, you know, exoticization to whom, right? Like exoticization is always externalized. There's got to be an other to the exotic subject, let's say. And then the question is, for whom, right? Like, why is that presumed to be, you know, a gesture of exoticization only in the presence of this other, right? And this normative other that you're, that you're talking about. So I think, yeah, you're right. There's definitely a slippery slope, I think, in uncritically pursuing that line of thought. But I also think that an ungrounded and whatever the, the grounds of the grounding, an ungrounded spirit is as detrimental as a fully fixed and grounded epistemology or, you know, spiritual impulse. And so I think there's a straddling and that's one that you know, we have been doing as Black people, as Africans, for centuries, right? To me, it almost harkens back to this sort of tradition modernity dialectic, which, you know, is a Eurocentric discursive practice as a way of proceeding with an understanding of oneself. I prefer to think of this not as a grounding that assumes authenticity and a kind of fixity yeah fixity and return even right to that fixity but yeah i think i'm in that paper that you mentioned refusing interpolation i was thinking about precisely this question right that you could say the same thing that a euro-american writer you know says or writes about and yet your work will always be brought back to or your artistic expression is always you know reduced to the clash between your social concerns and your artistic, you know, as if there is even that kind of uh, split. But what I was trying to do with the paper was to speak to an impossible position, which is to say a position that cannot be resolved, but can only ever really be negotiated. And this, of course, can be extrapolated to various other domains, not just literature, world literature, but any other kind of interface in which the world literary arena, you know, adjudicates the extent of your artistic achievements and so on, or, you know, political contributions or what have you. But in any situation where there is that externalized thing that I was talking about at the beginning, right, like the idea that to exoticize assumes a certain externality or a certain exteriority and then the question again is to whom and what kind of you know institutional mechanisms of power are in place to determine literary and artistic success it's not so much something that i think people can break out of or resolve and that is the nature of a double bind it is the the thing that that calls to our attention precisely because it is impossible, right? And it is that impossibility that calls for, you know, a constant negotiation. 
in a way where I don't want to say it's stuck, you know, but we can't undo the instantiation of world literature, right? But we can bypass it in certain ways. And I think one of the ways is by demurring when it comes to playing the tradition modernity kind of dialectic in the way that pursues a fixity on the one hand and an ongoing kind of march towards <laughs> whatever progress. And I was thinking particularly as I was preparing for our, in- our conversation interview today, I was reading the essay written by Professor Olufemi Taiwo. I don't know if you're familiar with their work. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was reading the essay for the first time, well, this essay, which is titled Being in the Room Privilege, Elite Capture and Epistemic Difference. And uh-huh. in this paper, Professor Taiwo speaks about standpoint epistemology, you know, speaking about how you are socially situated affects what you know. And this is, you know, feminists have been talking about this for a long time. Marx was talking about this for a long time. This is not a novel idea, but I thought what was deeply, deeply important was the way in which they kind of foreground the way in which I guess when we're being glib we call it virtue signaling but they're they're talking about the ways in which we have substituted kind of restitution for deference so we're going to say things like land acknowledgements we're going to say things like Black Lives Matter we're going to say things like put more African scholars in the curriculum as a gesture towards deference and I think what they do really incredibly in this essay is kind of demonstrate why difference is not necessarily an appropriate response to a call for restitution. And I'm curious in your own work, especially because, you know, it it just spoke so perfectly to your article on refusing interpolation. I'm curious to hear how you reflect on the significance of standpoint and how you reflect on what positionality does and what it doesn't do in the kind of real world situations where there are calls for restitution and needs for restitution. So my interest in that question, and I read it less as a solve the world question than as a perennial philosophical problem, right? And I think this is, this is something that we've heard before, the idea that, you know, there are material concerns. And so, you know, how are we, you know, balancing the need to attend to those versus the abstraction that we get taken up in philosophizing and so on? That's an old kind of question. The reason I bring that up is because what you're saying amounts to (laughs) the thesis 11 of Marx's thesis, which is that the philosophers have merely interpreted the world. The point, however, is to change it, right? And the idea is that we're preoccupying ourselves with an interpretation of the world, whereas the point is to change it. And then at the same time, you're having to balance the idea that there is something quite practical, there is something quite material in thinking and in thought, right? I don't know that it's the presumption or the premise of the distinction between you know thought and action is as unquestioning as it often presumes to be right like when these questions are put to us because i consider what we are doing to be a practice right someone like fred moton might call this a practice of black study right which in itself has resonance and vibrations and, and affective consequences right so yeah so i think there's that tension between thought that is expected to lead to action and then also action that cannot actually uh, go anywhere without thought because after action comes thought anyway right 1994 was a moment of action right or the post apart however you want to you know uh, you might assess the efficacy of that action in whatever way you wish right but there is a rupture a moment and you can talk about this in revolutionary terms where there have been less smooth transitions but that is a moment of action. And then what comes after action, right? Thought <laughs> is what we're back to that, right? The point, I guess, of what I'm trying to say is that whatever fruits are born from any action that is taken will need to be sustained by thought, mm. you know? will need to be sustained by a cultivated sense of thinking is important and is as important 
I think, as the material concerns, because thinking actually turns out is material. In Mo's work and practice, they invite us to consider that the ground upon which we make claims about our standing or positionality is in and of itself continuously shifting, inviting us to pay attention to how we read with new points of emphasis as the ground shifts. There is something between the past that gives you your identity and the future that calls for your identity. There's something on that temporal spectrum that is the the present that I think requires a balance both of that historical knowledge of yourself as well as yeah, knowledge of yourself in time. Well, one of the things that I say to my students is I want them to think of identification as Americans would say routes as opposed to roots, right? So as a pathway, a ground that is shifting as opposed to a rootedness that is unmoving, which is, you know, now that we've got Anand Singh's amazing work on mushrooms might actually force me to (laughs) reconsider my beautifully crafted metaphor around (laughs) the problem with the root. Mahita was kind of reflecting on the color blue, reflecting a lot on water. And I guess to stick with these very unwieldy metaphors, there is something for me that is important about being an academic citizen, about someone just interested in in thinking in the world, is that these things are supposed to offer us rafts. They're supposed to offer us something that we can hold on to while we swim in these waters that, yes, we might name as the modern tradition dialectic we might name as you know an urgent call for decolonization we might name them in all kinds of different phrases depending on the action we want to take but for me the value of universities and the value of just us thinking in community which happens also outside of the university obviously it's is what are these rafts that we're holding on to and particularly i'm interested in how do you build your rafts What intellectual genealogies do you cobble together to kind of create a raft for yourself to swim through these these waters? They could both be, you know, people you you found in the academy or elsewhere. But I'm just curious to know who is in your intellectual genealogy that helps you build these rafts so that you don't drown. I try not to be over-determined by a specific intellectual genealogy, so to speak. So if I say... Like, I wouldn't identify, I'm not, certainly not like post colonial or like, you know, Afro pessimist or like any of that stuff. If I say I'm a Marxist, that's something that I think, you know, translates outside of the academy. And it's not so much, you know, something that I'm thinking about in academic terms. But I would say, in terms of an intellectual genealogy of the type that you're, that I think you're referring to, I also try to be, and I, I heard the gurus say this at some point be promiscuous with your reading, right? Like, don't be like monogamously wedded to one school of thought and so I try to be as promiscuous as I can I'm a literary person but I read things you know and I have anchors you know that aren't exactly literary figures or you know writers so what I will say before you know getting to the meat of your question is that I also really appreciate writers who are fluid I appreciate thinkers that, you know, can change their minds. And of course, that also comes with time and how long one lives and so on, right? Like I imagine there are a couple of things that Fanon may have, you know, adjusted had he not died at age 27, right? Like, so that's also something to think about. But you can tell the capacity for, you know, fluidity or you can tell, you know, whether someone is a mushroom or, uh, you know, firmly rooted tree in terms of the intellectual grounding you can tell by the way that they invite the world to scrutinize right rather than being prescriptive i don't like prescriptive thinking of course there are moments that call for that so there are moments that call for like that kind of prescriptive writing and then there are moments that which are the moments that i like to linger in um where i'm you know invited to imagine something irreducible or incalculable so a lot of the times I find myself drawn, for instance, to Derridian type of analysis, right? Which I know is a pretty 
shameful thing to say perhaps <laughs> it's a vulgar <laughs> thing to say it's a vulgar thing to say sometimes because then again it's the material versus immaterial debate right it's like oh you want to wax lyrical about xyz when there's you know this this and that but i really appreciate derrida's concern for instance with the idea of a haunting or the specter that he writes about in specters of marx so it's a very different approach i think to contemporary social political economics that i have encountered in other philosophers i appreciate the idea of the eternal return of the repressed so yeah so i think derrida and his offsprings there are some obviously like pretty wacky people that i still find very very interesting and i think what i mean by the voice of and it's never the voice of obviously but i think someone that echoes a certain pulse you know that's detectable that they firstly can observe and then detect a pulse right that we can't ourselves someone who's a seer in in some kind of way this is what i think about when i think about like salt like you and i think about people like steve biko these are people who Yes, we're dealing with a contemporary moment and not just like futurist or like, you know, in that sort of like leap of imagination into, you know, time ahead. But I'm I'm thinking more like somebody that can accurately reflect us to ourselves, but also, and now this is not a somebody, but I'm talking about a body of work. It could be a body of, you know, thoughts. It could be, you know, I don't have that that I could say you know continentally honestly you not know. no smoke around you i was going to say something crude <laughs> not to gas you up but i definitely feel that like reading your work reading our dear friend julian ladi's work i often feel that the way in which uh you are able to both be attentive to the present moment that you're at where you got how you got there and also perhaps show what directions we might be going in i see that often in the way that a lot of my friends are working particularly because i love the fact that you merge both a serious commitment and rigorous commitment to what is called like classical academic scholarship and also you're a dj and the way in which you think through your playlists and curate experiences using music using our friends who make collages that for me is so exciting because it's kind of exploding what we might have historically perceived as the legitimate locus of like intellectual work it's like actually it is legitimate to make podcasts it is completely legitimate <laughs> to make <laughs> playlists it is legitimate to make collages precisely because not that the book is dead it will never die but more so to to attend to the fact that in the 21st century we have so many more tools to express a new vocabulary and we haven't found that vocabulary yet but we're at least kind of cobbling together these different media yeah, yeah. that for me I find very exciting yeah, in, in yeah. what we're doing and what a lot of our friends are doing I am just like mind blown the new vocabularies that Mo weaves together to build his raft are not only academic but also sonic. I was interested to learn how he thinks about the relationship between his music curatorial practice and his literary interests. So I come to world music through world literature. I was thinking about the ways in which music articulates a lot of the political life world of the books that I was reading. So I'm reading something by an Ethiopian writer in Amengesto for instance and thinking about some Ethiopian musicians operating or active around the time that he's writing about and Ethiopian musicians who like fled you know the red terror or whatever end up in DC only to be discovered you know much later like rediscover or maybe not discovered but you know what i mean like take off in 2021 or whatever so this is interesting to me like those you know networks that flow that algorithm of life is very interesting one to me and so i want to you know use music with its a temporal kind of force as a way to help me read some of the literature that i'm thinking about so my book will involve an analysis of both african and african music interspersed <laughs> From rock art to complex reflections on belonging, 
this episode has been a journey through ancestry. The afterlife is a strange thing to ponder. It disrupts the taken-for-granted logic of linear time to conflate is and was. To quote Faulkner's Requiem for a Nun, the past is never dead. It's not even past. Ancestors don't just pass down the genetic baton and disappear from view. They can linger with us, show up in unexpected texts and sonic forms, whispering and shouting for our attention. Our ancestors offer us topographical maps written in a myriad of forms. May we learn to be rigorous and curious readers. Do join us next month as we explore these ideas further with breath. It's now time to read the room. Chastwith is a collection of short stories from Pravis and Pele. And as the name states, it's different short stories that are all located in Chatsworth or surrounds in KZN. And that is a Indian township slash suburb area. A lot of working class, poor Indian and black people live in the area. And the reason why I love this book is because it's a work of fiction. However, the way in which Pravison creates his characters are so just tender. They're so careful and caring. And these are characters that demonstrate the kind of spectrum of human emotion. And oftentimes in fictional work I've read or watched that has to do with Indian South African lives and livelihoods and families, we are not offered the full spectrum of human experience and emotion and desire. So in these stories, he delves into it in a variety of different ways. There's a story about a ghost. There's a story about um, a Indian woman with albinism in apartheid South Africa. There's also a wonderful story about teenage desire and Indian girlhood and longing. I strongly suggest this book. The Academic Citizen is produced and funded by the South African Research Chair in Science Communication, hosted at Stellenbosch University. The aims of our podcast are to create a space for wide and deep discussion about key issues animating higher education in South Africa, Africa, the Global South, and beyond. Create a space for interdisciplinary exchange for academic researchers and educators, Help researchers, educators, and scientists to tell their stories and listen to and learn from each other's insights and experiences. And create a space for science in all forms to be communicated in order to serve social justice broadly conceived. We welcome your feedback, opinions, and suggestions for future guests and show themes. Email us at theacademiccitizen at gmail.com or visit our website, www.the-academic-citizen.org. This episode was hosted and written by Nosipo Mgomezulu, sound edited by Victoria Dalahab, scripting and production assistance by Taryn Mackay and Fumani Mabukwani, and Fumani Mabukwani who provides communication support. We thank Yolendri Apasami, Muhammad Shabangu, and Sven Osman for contributing to this episode. Mm-hmm.